Scott Manley here. Now, as a follow-up to my video on the most toxic rocket fuels, I thought it would be nice to cover a uh, well, an aircraft fuel technology which was the next big thing in the 1950s. These were zip fuels. Now, the idea with zip fuels was instead of boring old petrochemicals, you would have a higher energy fuel that would be able to deliver, you know, 40 to 50 percent more performance. So you could put more fuel inside your aircraft, more energy. You could perhaps get higher performance, longer endurance, depending upon what the mission required. Now, as a de while they're developing a successor to the B-52 bomber, this was one of the concepts that the designers embraced. Now, of course, being a bit of a dab hand with Kerbal Space Program, I thought it would be cool to build one of the concepts for this uh, replacement program. Now, the requirements were issued in 1955 with the idea that the bomber would enter service in 1963. This was to be something that would be able to fly as far as the B-52, but with the speed of the, the Hustler. But that speed wasn't required for the entire trip. They required a Mach 0.9 cruising speed and then a maximum possible entry and exit speed for a thousand nautical miles. And I'm going to say the design actually looks pretty darn anime. So th what this has is external wingtips which contain drop tanks and those would be the fueling it during the general cruise. The core of the aircraft that would contain the reserve of the special high-tech zip fuel as well as the regular fuel. So as they would kind of cruise around and then when they were required to head to the target they would ditch those outside tanks and that would reduce the wing surface area. And so then with the reduced drag, the reduced mass, they could throttle up their engines to maximum performance. They could head in at multiple times the speed of sound and hit their target and then get back out and oh, hopefully make it back home. Now this design is kind of scaled down to get the approximate airframe shape. And the truth is, the real things to get all the features were going to be massive. They figured out that they were something like 730. Fifty thousand pounds or 340 tons with their fuel loads. General Curtis Lee May famously remarked, this is not an airplane, it's a three-ship formation. But regardless of people's opinions, the Air Force was still interested in a new bomber and research continued. The promise of the zip fuels didn't quite pan out. Now, the compounds used in zip fuels were very similar to the hydrocarbon compounds used in jet fuel, but with carbon replaced by boron. Instead of calling them alkanes, you call them boranes. The three main molecules which were examined were diborane, which is the basic building block of the other compounds. Now, that was a gas at room temperature, which wasn't ideal. Also, it spontaneously combusted with oxygen. Pentaborane uh, was a liquid, but it would still spontaneously combust at just around room temperature. Decaborane, that had 10 boron atoms, that was actually stable at room temperature. Unfortunately, it was also solid. But the real deal breaker was the combustion products. On one hand, they would produce a highly corrosive mixture of boron and hydride and water, basically boric acid. And it would also produce boron carbide, which is an extremely react uh, refractory material. That means it's, it has a very high melting point. It's actually a r almost as hard as diamond, although not quite that hard. And what that would generally do is it would create a fine, very hard dust. That meant that if you used it in the front of the engine, where you have all your turbine blades and other stuff, that would just corrode those to nothing. They would grind them down. Uh, so the only place they could really use this was in the afterburner section, where there's no mechanicals, no moving parts. Then you could inject it in. You would lose some of the performance, but it would make for a very high-performing afterburner. However, that boron nitride would also form a black soot, so you would end up leaving a big trail across the sky, as you can see in this image of a test. Anyway, after a few more years of iterating on the design of the next generation bomber, they came up with the XB-70, the Valkyrie. Now, I tried to build this during a live stream on Tuesday night, but I actually couldn't fit in all six jet engines and make it look cool. So we had to make do with only four, but regardless, it performs pretty well. The wing design obviously changed to a straight-up uh, you know, straight delta wing. They got rid of the external drop tanks, 
but the biggest change is that the cruise speed is now Mach 3. They, they figured out basically if you optimize the engine for these very high speeds, you use just as much fuel if you travel at high altitudes and high speeds. So the Valkyrie was designed to travel at Mach 3 at about 20 kilometers of altitude. But also it had this interesting variable geometry concept. So the wingtips would bend down like this. Now initially they would bend down by about 45 degrees and then as the velocity got higher they would go further down. The maximum deployment would be about 65 degrees. And in this configuration it was designed to trap the compression wave underneath the fuselage or underneath the lifting body so it would get more lift, it would actually increase the longitudinal stability because they would essentially act like tailplanes. And there's also an effect at supersonic speeds where with their wings the center of lift gets pulled forwards so by reducing the amount of wing surface that would then keep the uh, center of lift further back and therefore again keep the thing more stable. The aircraft also incorporated a variable geometry cockpit to reduce drag at high speeds. But the Valkyrie never flew with the zip fuels that had been developed and of course it never became an operational uh, aircraft because it just arrived at the wrong time. It came along when ICBMs were becoming the preferred way to launch missiles. Then on top of that, surface-to-air missiles were becoming very good at intercepting aircraft. Even very fast aircraft were at risk. And the only way they could hope of avoiding these was by flying at very low altitudes. And that meant that that Mach 3 top speed was out of the window and replaced with a more pedestrian Mach Mach 0.9. I'm sure it didn't help either that that massive air intake probably was a really good radar reflector and would be visible all over enemy territory from a long way out. And so the B-52 that it was intended to replace is still flying today. And the Valkyrie aircraft which were built became the biggest experimental aircraft flown. Tragically, however, one of them was destroyed by a mid-air collision with another aircraft flown by none other than Joe Walker. Joe Walker you may not have heard of, but he was the only person to fly the X-15 over 100 kilometers on two different missions. So that made him not only the seventh US astronaut to get his space wings, but he was also the first person to ever fly multiple missions above the Karman line. The co-pilot of the Valkyrie would also lose his life in that accident. However, the other XB-70 does remain in a museum. It's at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. If you want to look for it, it's obviously a very special aircraft. Anyway, there is one thing that Borane did deliver, and that is uh, triethyl borane, which is used to ignite rocket engines. It's actually used to ignite the SR-71's engines, but it's also used, uh, along with triethyl aluminium, to ignite the engines on the Falcon 9 rocket. That is the green flame you sometimes see just as the rockets light back up again. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.